There we go. Thank you. Okay, so I was just saying that Joe and I will give a brief introduction today of Avarice and G, or the Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer Next Generation. So they used to be Avarice Classic back in the 80s, and Avarice NG is just uh, the latest version. So it's essentially an instrument that we can mount to an aircraft, and it collects hyperspectral data. So our goals for today is that we want you to be able to walk away feeling familiar with hyperspectral data, including data from Avarice and G. We want you to understand the fundamental methods for displaying and exploring this data, specifically using Python. And then we'll also talk more about the spectral feature fitting methodology towards the end of this presentation. So. With that in mind, how many of you, by a show of hands, have used hyperspectral data before? Okay, cool. And just as a side note, how many of you, by a show of hands, have been following the images that were released from the James Webb Telescope earlier this week? Okay, much more of you. <laughs> uh, well, one of them that they released that I thought was really cool is this exoplanet. It's about a little over a thousand light years away from our Earth, and they saw a distinct water signal coming from this atmosphere. Well, how did they do that? They used spectroscopy, right? Then they looked at this spectrum and saw that, um, that water signal. So in a lot of ways, what we'll be talking about today is essentially the same concept. There's a lot of overlap there. They're just pointing their sensor out towards space. We're pointing our sensor down towards the ground. I just thought this was really cool, but um, it's still the same basic concepts of spectroscopy when you're working with hyperspectral data. Okay, so coming back down to Earth now, <laughs> I know that some of you are very familiar with remote sensing, maybe some of you are more new, so I'm just going to do a quick overview to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, before we start talking about hyperspectral data in detail. So, um, Avarice NG is a form of passive remote sensing, so that means that we're depending on the sunlight. So we have incoming solar radiation, and that will be either reflected, absorbed, or transmitted, depending on the surface material. So if it's, let's say there's vegetation or soil, rock, or in our case, we care about snow, that is going to um, alter the amount of energy that's again, reflected, absorbed, or transmitted, or maybe even a combination of all three of those. And the spectral resolution is key in helping us differentiate between these surface types. So in remote sensing, we're constantly talking about spatial resolution, temporal resolution, spectral resolution. I know these terms get thrown around a lot. I know it's pretty basic, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, how would you define spatial resolution? Feel free to just yell it out. <laughs> what is spatial resolution? Yeah, like the area you're covering. What about temporal resolution? Yeah, how often that area is covered, right? So how often maybe a satellite passes by? Perfect. So then how would you define the spectral resolution? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The spe spectral bandwidth. Perfect. So the spectral resolution can be defined as the wavelength interval. And so depending on that interval, how narrow or broad it is, will determine the detail of the spectral response that we're receiving. So, um, of course, the finer the interval, the finer the detail, the larger the interval, the more coarse, the less detail in that spectral response. Perfect. Okay, so with that in mind, when I scroll down to this image right here, this figure, what is the spectral resolution of this based on what this is showing? Close. So if you're looking at the bandwidth interval, yeah, it'd be five nanometers. Perfect. Exactly. So it's just this wavelength interval that we're looking at. That is our spectral resolution. Perfect. And then you might also hear 
people refer to this as the band center. And that is just referring to the full width half maximum. So it's just like it says, it's pretty much just the spread of this energy, the spread of this data at the center point. So perfect. Again, just the spectral resolution is the wavelength interval of this band or channel. Perfect. Okay, moving on. So I think most of us are probably the more familiar with multispectral data. And multispectral instruments have larger spectral resolutions, so a larger wavelength interval, and they have fewer bands. So this level of detail can be limiting. It might be a little bit harder to tell one surface type from another because we just don't have that level of detail. But hyperspectral instruments, on the other hand, have relatively narrow, more narrow wavelength intervals. And in this case, sometimes we have hundreds of bands. So the level of detail is pretty impressive. So here's an example where we have Landsat 8 on the left. This is the operational land imagery, and we're showing seven bands here compared to Avaris on the right with over 200 bands. And you can see, just looking at the spectral response, the amount of detail that you're getting with Avaris, right? is amazing, it's beautiful. I might be biased in saying this, but it's, I think it's really cool. <laughs> okay, so uh, because of, we have this level of detail, we have so much more information about the surface and its characteristics, which again, can tell us more about maybe the albedo, which would then feed into improving our energy balance models. So there are a lot of benefits from having this level of detail in our data. Um, so with that in mind, we have Avaris and G coming together with Snow X. So Avaris and G is measuring the upwelling radiance across 425 spectral bands. And this is being flown at 25,000 feet above sea level with a spatial resolution of four meters, a spectral resolution of five nanometers. And this is ranging from about 300 nanometers to a little over 2,500 nanometers. Um, and we have three flight dates for 2021. So the first one was in March, so March 19th of 2021. And so we still have cold, clean snow at this time. And then we have one on April 11th. So the snow is warming up just a little bit. We're starting to see some light dusting. And then by the end of April, April 29th, um, at this point, the snow is much warmer. We're seeing darker dust either at or near the surface. And we have two sites that we have flown over. One is um, Senator Beck Basin of San Juan Mountains in Colorado. And this is more of a mountainous alpine environment compared to Grand Mesa, which is also in Colorado, which is more uh, flat and vegetated. So we can look at um, this these uh, spectral responses, this, um, this hyperspectral data across uh, different snow environments, and then also throughout the snow melt season. And so just to give you a rough idea of this type of, of this data that we're talking about. So we have four flight lines for each study site. Um, so for each time it flies over Senator Bet Basin, for example, it's gonna have four flight lines. So that's eight flight lines a day. So that means that we have 24 flight lines total. And then again, because we have this great amount of detail, of course, that's going to increase our file size, right? So just to give you an idea of what that looks like, one flight line for Senator Red Basin is about two gigabytes. And then one flight line over Grand Mesa is about 10 gigabytes. So my tip for you is to make sure that you crop to the area that you're most interested in, so you don't necessarily have to process these entire large file sizes, right? And Joe will walk us through how to do that in just a minute. Okay, so I know that you are all just dying to get your hands on this data, and we have two data products. The first one is spectral radiance, that's our L1B, and then we also have our L2, which is corrected reflectance. And L2 will be available to the public very soon through NSIDC. So I'm going to hand the mic over now to Joe, who's going to give us a first look at our data. Is that coming? Oh, higher. Jesus. 
Oh, what now? Oh, I guess I'm going to do it this way. Um, okay. So now that Chelsea gave us a good intro of how the data is, where the data is, and how data looks like. Um, yeah, like, like you said, we have it submitted to any IDC, so it's right now going into QC process, should be available soon. But what I want to give you today as an intro is when you first get the files, you're always going to get two. So there's going to be the actual reflectance flight data, which is the band data, and then there's going to be a header file. And you always will need both in order to process it or to know what's going on with the RFS and NG data. So here, if you want to follow along in the notebook, um, we have it right now uh, hosted on the data repository of SnowX, just to give you a little sample. So there's first the data file, like I said, then there's the header file, and then there's also the original header file. So what I, gonna, what I gave you in the sample repository is a subset, and hold on tight for a minute here why we need two header files for this time around. So the first thing um, I like to do is, um, you know, instead of just opening up the whole entire file, gigabytes of data and know what's going on, where they are, you can also use a little trick to just know the location of those flight lines. And then for instance, if you have your area of interest, you're gonna map that to a little um, Explorer map to figure out, okay, which file do I actually wanna download instead of getting all the data at once. So for that, I use um, GeoPandas, and GeoPandas also comes with a plotting library called Folium. Folium is just an interactive um, web map. And I also use our good old friend GDAL. If you haven't used GDAL before on the command line or something like that, I highly recommend you getting familiar with it. It saves my bacon many times, and I, I'm a big fan. So just as a FYI here. And the command I'm using right now out of the toolbox from GDAL is called GDAL T index, which is also short for GDAL tile index. And what it can do for us, if you have a bunch of flight lines downloaded, it can create us an index file that basically takes the outline for each flight line, saves it in a separate index file, and it can use that to plot with a library instead of you know having to download the entire like having to load up the whole file into a map. So I put a command in here that I use. So here's the MGDAL. Can you guys see the mouse? Okay, I um, hope so. Here's a GLT index command. I'm going to project it into a 4328, so at 26, so we have a common map. This is how the um, Folium library standard reads its data in. And then I'm going to give them all the files that I had downloaded there on our computer. And the way this command basically works is kind of this is uh, just a wildcard for all the files that are matching this naming pattern. So a star is just like if you're familiar with Bash, for instance, if you want to list your files in directory and you do, for instance, ls and then the first prefix of the file and then a star, it will give you all the files that's in there. And you can use the same command there with GDAL to say, give me all these files into my index. I also explained this command a little further down here in the, in the breaking down the command. But for the interest of time, I'm just gonna move on here to give you straight that example. Um, um, I guess, like I said, you can use it the wildcard like a bash. And then you have this index file. This index file, I'll also upload it there to the data repository. You can download it. And then I'm going to read that straight in. So the nice thing, what I like about um, GeoPanas, I don't know if we touched on this this week, you can either have the file locally or GeoPanas also can read it from a URL. So you don't necessarily have to download all the data. You can just say here, GeoPanas, read this file. It's hosted somewhere else. So it saves you downloading in a bunch of data. So what I did here, I have three flight, like I uh, have three files. One is the flight line. Like I said, I created with GDAL. The other one is center back basin. It's a big outline. And then we have the swamp angel study plot. So kind of uh, getting down to where we're actually gonna look later. So swamp angel is gonna be what we're gonna work on for the rest of the tutorial. And the way it works with the, the folium library is basically I loaded up it as a read line. And then you can just put the dot explore command with that geopanas data frame. And this will basically give you a layer and a map and then you can nicely stack those different layers you created into one map. So you see up here, SBB is going to be my master layer, so to speak. And then underneath in the second layer, you see I give SBB as, a, like, as an option into the plotting call. So what you end up with is something that looks like this. So here you see we have just the four flat lines that overlap with um, center back as a basin. And then I should also note this little box up here to the right. I added this with the layer control. So this is that. 
But now if you want to just explore, let's remove Avaris, let's remove Swamp Angel. So now I have Sender to back. Move it to the right so it's a more obvious. And adding Swamp Angel, here's our little study plot. And then add the flight lanes. So I like to use it this way. It's kind of really fast and easy to create. And if we zoom out, you see these are the four flight in the goer. And now if I hover my mouse, I can exactly know, look, I want this flight line. I will download it and now further process it for our analysis. Now that they did that, um, there's a Jupyter Notebook has something called magic commands. I want to quickly touch on those. There's a bunch of those. And for instance, if you want to know where you currently are in the Jupyter Hub, with that notebook, you just type the PWD, which is the bash command. But if you put like the percentage in front of it, it turns into a magic command. But well, that's what they really call it, magic horses. And uh, you can also store this, by the way, into a Python library, which I think is kind of nice to combine these two things together. So now I'm just creating here a variable that's stored where my notebook is. We downloaded the files earlier, and I can now these, use these. This is called an F string in Python, by the way, when you have an F in front of it. You can do um, the interpolation. So what your variable was and something else, for instance, it can be combined as one string. I think most people are used to like doing the plus sign. I prefer this. This is kind of a Python 3.8 thing. It reads nicer to my, um, for me personally and also faster. Next, we're going to use here is something called the Spectral Library, um, which is um, a third party library that somebody wrote for us nicely to handle hyperspectral data. So it can handle more than just. Um, the average in G. And for today here, we first open the header file, the SVB, and we want to know the band senders. And if you do that, we will see wah, 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 didn't work so well because I'm, this is where the original header came in. So the header format that the way the Spectral library reads it relies on the original output of Envy. If you guys ever used Envy, like the, the software, it has a different formatting of the header than GDAL will do if you subset a average and G flight line. So it's kind of a heads up. If you do subset with GDAL and it will write out a header for you again, it will be a different format. I don't know why. Um, we can all complain about it later. Um, but like I said, luckily you can also just go for the original header file and give it then the SPD um, data file, so the subset that we create with GDAL. And if we do that, all of a sudden it turns better as we do the same thing we did before. We look at the, I guess he is missing, I know this is an output. If you look at the type header in for now, it gives you as an object back. And if you inspect that object, turn it into a NumPy array, all of a sudden, yay, here they are. So these are the really actual bands that the hypercube, as I want to call it, so we can imagine ourselves like it's a stack cube and each layer is a band. This is how what the band um, values are for each of these layers. Oh. Um, do I have that? I didn't, don't have the complete one, but if you follow that notebook and just put out header, then you can get the full complete thing. Yeah. All right, for the audience online, so Jack was just, I'm saying that here for the NV output, it helps a lot to also just print the raw header and learn how to parse the information there because Envy puts a lot more in there. For instance, um, additional information outside the bands. So it's always helpful if you explore a new hyperspectral data set to look at the complete header and get a better feeling for it. All right, so moving on here, and um, I also highlighted, for instance, one thing that I want to emphasize on for um, hyperspectral or average and G data here. Um, if you read out the map info, the important part is the rotational here. So if you want to then transform this and your software, there's a commercial software, there's a GIS software, I'm not going to say the name, that will sometimes forget to read the rotational axis in. If you project and forget the rotational axis of the 15 degrees there, you're map will end up in the wrong space. So just a heads up, GDAL does it. So if you use GDAL, again, it's your friend. And the way it, the whole map info reads, like this map info header, I put out here. And I guess for the interest of time, I'm going to just quickly move along here. I'm already getting close here. 
All right, so to explore the data, I just picked three random bands. And the way you're gonna find these bands is I use a NumPy function where I use the difference between the band that I want and find the minimum for it. And I use this with the argmin and an absolute difference of NumPy. If you do that, for instance, here, we get number 53. So this is the array index I have to access if you wanna read that specific data. And then I'm gonna wrap this around here in a little function cause I like to reuse it later. You know, if you come back two weeks later, haven't read your code, you don't know what MP arc max mean mean, at least you have a method here that wraps it so you know what's going on. So this means right now here, we have band number 27 and 13 for the three bands I picked. And then I'm gonna go ahead here and uh, I gave you here uh, the, how I subsidized the Swamp Angel. Um, but then in the end, heads up here, I opened the image file now with the original header. So now that we're gonna actually load the data, we know the bands, we're gonna swap back to the original header file. This is important for the spectral library. And we can inspect, these are the many rows and samples and bands for 26 at 25 and here, image load loads the band, and we're going to give it those three bands. This is how the spectral library works. So this is specific to this library. And here we are. This is center back. If you have been there, I guess you kind of find it. Here's the tower. You come in from the right. So yay, this is our first look. I have an exercise in there for later if you want to play around just with the bands. But now that we all want to know how the space telescope gets water out of this, I'm going to hand it back to Chelsea. Cool. Thanks, Joe. So as Joe was mentioning, um, so now we know how to open, explore, maybe even display avarice data. But what if we want to take it one step further? What if we want to answer some type of question, do some analysis um, using this hyperspectral data? And of course, the sky is the limit, right? There's so many options, so many things that we can do with this highly detailed data. But we're just going to show you one method today, and that is referred to as spectral feature fitting. And I could spend probably an hour just talking about this alone, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to keep it very general, very simple, just give you the basic idea, and then we can go down rabbit holes later if you would like to. So essentially what we're saying here is that in a nutshell, um, this method will take the absorption feature from our image spectra and then compare it to a reference spectra to see how much of a certain material is within a given pixel. So for example, we're going to look at Swamp Angel study plot using an ice absorption feature to see how much ice might potentially be in a specific pixel. So that's the exercise that we're going to walk through right now. Um, but to do this, we need to first understand the Beer-Lambert equation. So Beer's law, if you remember from your remote sensing classes. And what this is saying is that you have some sort of incoming uh, irradiance. So you have irradiance, right? Incoming solar radiation in this case. And that is going to be transmitted through a homogeneous medium. So there's one assumption that we have going on right there. Snow might not necessarily always be homogeneous, but in this case, we're just going to pretend like it is for this example. And it's going to travel through a path length D, and it will be absorbed based on this absorption coefficient, right? So overall, big picture, we're just saying that Beer's law is saying that irradiance decreases exponentially based off of this absorption coefficient and, again, the path length D. Um, and then with this principle in the back of our minds, this, um, this, this fundamental law about absorption, we can then maybe estimate the equivalent thickness of ice in a pixel. So that's the main goal. That's the objective for this piece right here. So first things first, we're going to load our reference spectra. So he, we've provided this table for you, this H2O indices.csv. And you can see that it has five columns uh, within this table. And the first column is just the list of wavelengths. So it's ranging from 400 to 2,500 nanometers. And then in the second and third column, 
we have the simple refractive index and the extinction coefficient for water. And that might ring a bell. Maybe the simple refractive index and the extinction coefficient might remind you of the, um, the complex refractive index. And that's just letting you know if a certain material, how much it will reflect and how much it will absorb, right? Um, but as I mentioned before, we're just focusing on ice for this example. So we are only going to be focusing on columns four and five, which give us N and K um, for, for ice. But if you remember, when we look at our Beer-Lambert equation, there's no N or K in that, in that formula, right? So how are we going to connect this table to this beer to beer's law. Well, let me tell you. So we can actually relate the absorption coefficient to K or our extinction coefficient using this formula here. So four times pi multiplied by K or our extinction coefficient divided by the wavelength. So here, I'm just going to do the simple equation here in our code, go ahead and plot it. And this is our output. So for each wavelength, we have our absorption coefficient. And I don't know about you, but I feel like this maybe isn't super useful, super intuitive. It's basically just letting us know that we have a lot of absorption going on in the short wave infrared. And we kind of already knew that, right? So we can take this one step further. And something that maybe is a little bit more intuitive to us would be calculating the E folding distance. Right, um, that's letting us know how much absorption is taking place. So if I scroll down here, we have our absorption coefficient multiplied by our path length. And if that equals one, then we can solve for the path length by dividing our absorption coefficient by one. So I feel like e-folding distance alone, we could spend quite a bit of time talking about this, but essentially the general idea is that how far can the light penetrate before it's completely absorbed, right? Um, so we're looking at this in centimeters. Um, sorry, I'm just kind of skimming through the code, but basically it's just plugging in that equation that I just showed and then plotting it on a graph. And here's what our output. So we have our wavelengths again, you can see there's quite a bit of absorption going on again in these shortwave uh, infrared regions. And then over here, basically what this is saying is that if we have about five centimeters, that's our e-folding distance here. So at this particular wavelength, hypothetically, we would have five centimeters before the, the majority of light is absorbed. So you can see here, this little dip that we only need three and a half or so, maybe four. So we have some sort of absorption going on in this location right above about 1000 nanometers. So maybe we'll just keep that in the back of our minds for now. Now, as we move on, um, so that was our reference spectra, right? So that's showing us just the N and K for ice absorption. But now let's compare that to our average image. So we're gonna load a point of interest. And for this example, we just selected a point in the middle of Swamp Angel study plot. But you could do this for multiple points. You could select a region of interest, uh, but we just did one point to keep it simple. So like Joe was showing earlier, we're gonna start a new map. Uh, this is for Swamp Angel study plot again. And we're going to add our GeoJSON file that one points our point of interest to this map. Um, we're going to add our Latin long so we can plot it. And this is what it looks like. This is. The swamp angel study plot like Joe showed earlier, but now we've added this orange point. This is the pixel that we're interested in. We want to see how much ice is potentially in this pixel. <clears throat> so now, um, even though we have our latitude and longitude, we need to figure out the coordinates in pixel space. And so we're just figuring out where that point is in terms of the array. Um, Sorry, I'm kind of flying through this code, but if you have questions, just let me know. I just want to get through the, the general overlook of this, of this exercise. Okay, so now that we have our point selected, we have it mapped, we are now going to look at this, um, the spectrum at that given pixel. So because it's a snow-covered pixel, 
you can see that we have higher reflectance in the visible, it kind of drops in the near infrared, and then it's much lower again in the shortwave infrared, as we would expect, right? Okay, so just to recap, we have our reference spectra, and now we have our measured um, spectrum from the average image. And we can compare the two to see how much ice we have here. Before we do our spectral feature fitting, there is a little bit of housekeeping that we need to do just to make sure that we're playing nicely with Python. Uh, first, we just need to make sure that our um, reference spectra has the same spectral resolution as our image spectra. So we'll do a little bit of interpolation to make sure they're aligned well. And then we also need to set our lower bound and our upper bound of our absorption feature. So this part is a little tricky, it might be a little bit subjective, um, to trying to determine where that absorption feature begins and ends. I think my tip for that is to just tr trial and error, just give it a try, see if, how it plays out. And then once we have those bounds selected, we will then select the wavelengths within those two boundaries. So we're just narrowing it down to that region. And now we can actually begin our spectral feature fitting. And like most things in life, there's always more than one way to do something, right? So for this particular example, we're going to use the non-negative least squares approach. And this is coming from Thompson et al. 2015. But of course, there are other spectral feature fitting methods that you could use as well if you're interested. Um, but for this particular example, they are wanting to find these four values. So the offset, the slope of the upward trending line, and the slope of the downward trending line as well as the equivalent thickness of ice. Um, so to do that, I'm gonna skip through some of these details. You can look at this paper in detail if you're interested. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna keep moving on. Um, and again, here's another little housekeeping item. We just want to make sure that we have our wavelength array, our ice absorption coefficient array, and our reflectance array all in, um, all in a format that is similar. So we want to make sure that all of these arrays can speak to each other. They're all in the same format. And as I keep scrolling down, um, this right here is just plugging in and solving for the equation from Thompson et al. 2015. And that is going to give us our estimated ice thickness. So here we have 1.774 centimeters. Now, does that mean that we need 1.774 centimeters before a sorry, 1.774 centimeters of ice before the majority of our light is absorbed. Not necessarily because we do have a lot of assumptions going on, right? So like I mentioned before, we're assuming a homogeneous medium. Is snow necessarily always homogeneous? Maybe not necessarily, right? And then we're also assuming a one-way transmittance. And so we're not taking into account that snow is scattering the light. So that's another assumption too. So while this might not be a direct you know, measurement, it can give us some idea of maybe locations of where ice is more than others, or maybe even how this changes throughout the season. Um, so it is helpful, but it, you don't necessarily want to take this uh, too literally, if that makes sense. It's more better to give you an idea of, um, of where the majority of ice might be located. So then we can model our spectral ice feature and plot it so that we can then compare it with our measured ice spectrum. And you can see that they fit pretty well, which is telling us that there is some sort of ice within that given pixel. If you had done this for a pixel with vegetation or a pixel of just a lake, um, I don't think it would, have lined, it would not have lined up quite as nicely, but because it is snow and there is some sort of ice, you can see that it fits quite well. So thank you for your time. And just to wrap up, I hope that you can walk away now today feeling a little bit more comfortable with hyperspectral data. You have some tools now of how to explore it. And we've also gone through some of these spectral or these Python libraries that will hopefully be helpful to you as you look at Avers data in the future. So thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Sure. <laughs>
That's a good question. I would say just ice like within as part of the snow, not necessarily an ice layer specifically, but just maybe like distributed throughout, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's more of a calibration purpose. Yeah, great question. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I've done this before with that similar condition, and it just, there was quite the gap between the two lines. So, okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>